Hello viewers, and welcome back to another episode of The Model Guy. And in this episode, I'll be taking on one of my bigger projects, Tamiya's F14D Tomcat, also known as the Bombcat. I'll be adding some Edward goodies like ejection seats, some exhaust nozzles, and some Edward 3D space decals for the cockpit. I'll also be using some decals from Furball and some loners from the AMK kit so I can do a Bounty Hunter's Bird. But that's enough talk about the kit for now. Let's talk about the history of one of the sexiest aircraft ever designed. The F-14 Tomcat was designed by Grumman after the U.S. Navy submitted a request for a new fighter that could carry a larger radar airborne and launch larger and longer ranged missiles than the F-4 Phantom was currently capable of. At the time, the Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara thought he could pull off another joint solution that had been successful like the F-4 Phantom, having both the Navy and the Air Force use the same fighter, saving money in development. However, when the Navy tried to navalize the F-111 Aardvark, it just turned into a program that spiraled out of control due to the F-111 already being a large and heavy aircraft. 22 months after Grumman was awarded the contract from the Navy, the first F-14 Tomcat took flight. As important as the F-14 Tomcat was for the Navy, it wasn't going to be useful unless it was able to launch and use AIM-54 Phoenix missiles. These missiles were designed with the idea that they could reach out and hit a target over 100 nautical miles away from the fighter. Ideally, the range where Russian bombers would be trying to launch their own anti-ship missiles. In one of the most expensive missile tests ever conducted, an F-14 Tomcat fired six Phoenix missiles at six targets, with four successfully hitting them. Keep in mind, those Phoenix missiles go for about a million dollars a pop, so if you're firing six and only four are working, that's a lot of change that's going to be left in your glove box. During the testing though, it was discovered that one of the missiles failed to hit its target because the drone itself that was being targeted had failed to produce a proper radar return that would simulate a MiG-21 aircraft. One other notable event from the testing of the Phoenix missile system was when a Tomcat was able to destroy a drone over 110 nautical miles away. That's 200 kilometers. Speaking of new design and development, I decided on this F-14 model to go all in with some cool products. Some of those being from Ennies, who does 3D design work and offers both printed items for sale from his website, or items that you can download and print yourself. I also chose to use Edward's 3D space decals for the cockpit of the F-14 itself. Even though the Tamiya F-14 kit is regarded as one of the best kits to come out in the 2000 period for models, like anything, things have gotten better over time, and although that cockpit detail is okay, it doesn't mean it can't be better, and in comes the new revolution of 3D printed decals. This is a very quick and efficient way to improve the detail in the office of your model, where one option would be to buy a new resin replacement that's probably going to cost you about $30 or $40. A 3D decal set might cost you 15 so it's a great option for those budget builders. This is a great option for modelers who just want a simple build and a nice looking cockpit, and even modelers who may have some medical restrictions and might not have the hand-eye coordination or eyesight they used to. Instead of painting, repainting, touching up, and getting frustrated, this is a quicker option to have a model that you're happy with. One other quick update I made to the cockpit you may have noticed was using some two-part epoxy to improve the texture of the canvas covers in the cockpit. Just a note though, if you are choosing to go that route, make sure your canopies fit before you commit paint. Because the Tamiya kit has some very tight tolerances and that can come back to bite you very quickly. The only problem I've had with using 3D printed decals is that sometimes the colors don't match the rest of the cockpit that's painted. But that's pretty easy fix just by using some brush paint and some washes to tie everything together. One thing that I really respect Tamiya for as a brand is that they're never happy with how their kits are going together. Where this Tomcat was the model kit in 2000s with fit and engineering, Tamiya didn't stop there. Their new P38, their F4, their F35s are even better than this F14, so that should be a lesson to other brands. Don't be happy sitting on your laurels. One warning I will give to potential builders of the Tamiya F-14 though, is that this aircraft is massive. You have to treat it as a 132 scale kit because it's gonna take you quite a long time to paint it. In fact, it took me about three weeks to build the kit and then another month and a half to finish the painting and weathering. So that just gives you an idea of how big of a project you're in for. 
Even though the F-14 Tomcat quickly became a star in both the Navy and on film, with the best aviation movie of all time featuring the Tomcat, back now to the history of the Tomcat. You may be asking yourself, if this was such a great fighter and great for fleet defense and later carried bombs, why isn't it still in service like the F-15 and the F-16 that both also entered service in the 1970s? And if you're looking for a quick, simple answer, it's money. The F-14 was one of the most expensive aircraft to maintain and continue flying, especially when it came down to cost per hour. And what really limited the Tomcat is that it was only really designed for one role, and that was shooting down other aircraft. With the Navy looking to save money by rolling attack aircraft and fighters into one airframe, like the F-18 Hornet, the Tomcat really didn't stand a chance. The F-14 didn't go quietly into the night though, and in fact the 1980s spurned two movies with the F-14 at the center. The first one being the very popular Final Countdown, and the second one being some film called Top Gun you might have heard of. Alright, that snarky comment wasn't really warranted because Top Gun is a great movie from the 80s and it inspired a lot of kids to become pilots and greatly increased US Navy recruiting. Even 33 years after the original Top Gun, people's imaginations were still captured by the F-14 when it was featured in Top Gun Maverick. One other film that featured the F-14 that some of you may not have heard of was called Speed and Angels, which was actually a documentary following naval aviators on their journey to become Navy pilots. Speaking of the journey of becoming a naval aviator and the dangers involved, one of the most notable incidents involving the F-14 was the death of Lieutenant Kara Haltgreen. While the U.S. Navy was pushing to get more females in frontline roles, Kara Haltgreen was the first one to be an F-14 Tomcat pilot and be certified for combat. I'm not looking to cause controversy here as plenty of male naval aviators have been killed in training incidents and at the boat, but the facts of the crash were when Kara was coming into land, she overcorrected with the left rudder, which stopped airflow into the left engine and caused it to stall. Because that engine had stalled and the placement of the F-14's engines, just like you saw in Top Gun, the aircraft excessively yawed and the Rio decided to punch out when he noticed that the aircraft could not be recovered. Unfortunately, Kara, when her seat ejected, she was punched into the water head first as the Tomcat had already rolled past 90 degrees of bank. Because Lieutenant Hawkring was the first female naval aviator to die in a crash, there was quite a lot of media coverage and speculation that resulted from the incident. Even with all the media scrutiny, stories, rumors, and blowback on the Navy, women now make up 15% of pilots in the U.S. Navy. As for the engines causing spins in the Tomcat, 40 of them were lost due to this issue. It wasn't just the space between the engines in the F-14A that caused a lot of problems, but the engines themselves. The TF-30 engines in the F-14As had a tendency for the turbine fan blades to prematurely fail. And if you have an engine blowing up inside of an aircraft full of fuel, that can be a problem. Also, the very system that added the cool factor to the f 14 swing wings was another nail in its coffin. The swing wing design and mechanics were very heavy, and overall maintenance of the Tomcat could be between 24 to 60 hours of maintenance for one hour of flight time. Now back to the model. I love building naval aircraft because of the depth of weathering it allows you to do. And the first steps I do for painting are part of my weathering process. I don't start with an even color of paint. I like to build everything up in layers by using different grays, blues, browns, khaki colors, just to have the aircraft have a depth to the paint. And by doing this and using very thin layers to blend it all together, you can really control how much that paint dances. You can also accent it later on with oils or even cover it up some more if you're not happy with how things work. Some people rely on oil paints to do that. Myself, I'm still a fan of using the airbrush to do it because I find I have a lot more control. What I'll do with the oils, I just leave that for some more localized weathering like access panels or leaks and things like that. 
U.S. Navy tactical paint schemes are my favorite to work with because that gray gives you a lot of flexibility on how your weathering works out. If you look at two pictures of two aircraft on the same ship, they're completely different. The one might look gray, one might have fresher paint and look more blue, and the sky is really the limit to what you want to do. This is a very dynamic process and it's controlled by both pre and post shading if you're familiar with those schools of thought. Even though that blend layer can technically be the final paint layer, you can make it dance even more by doing some post shading with some lighter or darker or completely different colors. Two colors that I noticed really change what the gray does on top are red browns and that khaki color. They really give a whole different look to the paint and give it a really nice distressed look. The reason I'm painting the stripes on the nose of this aircraft instead of using the decals from AMK is that I found the light ghost gray color on the decal didn't even come close to matching the underside of the aircraft. It was more of a bronzish tint to it which didn't make any sense at all. And the medium gray was too much of a brown which was really weird. I ended up painting the markings on just to have them match the colors that were being used on the rest of the aircraft. If you're wondering why I didn't just take the simple route and use the kit decals, the problem is that they're not simple to use. The Tamiya decals are very thick and require a lot of work and gloss and sanding to get them to sit flush and look proper. So in the end, it's actually easier just to mask and paint. And now for the hardest part of the build, which in hindsight wasn't too bad. As you can see here, the Edward nozzles don't fit flush to the kit part and at first I thought I had missed a step or maybe I had the wrong nozzles but as it turns out the quickest fix was to just trim the inside of the kit part. Nowhere in the instructions did Edward tell you to do this but after a little bit of head scratching and thinking this was the simplest way to fix the problem and in the end after a little bit of sanding to the tube's edge everything went together quite well and I was able to super glue it in place after painting. In reality, this only took me about 20 minutes per engine to fix, so it wasn't really a big deal. I just thought it was fair that you should know about it should you choose to purchase these resin parts. But keep in mind, anytime you're purchasing resin parts, there's a possibility that sometimes they don't fit 100% and you will need some thinking to get them in place. The only place that I found the F-14 from Tamiya lacking in detail were the engine nozzles and the ejection seats. So those are definitely areas I would recommend updating. For the remaining markings on the Tomcat for the Bounty Hunters, I used the remaining AMK decals that were all in that gunship gray color. After that, it was time to move on to the furball decals. All of them went down with no issues and I just used some Tamiya Mark Fit Super Strong to get them into the panel lines. According to the latest episode of the Sprue Cutters Union, apparently there's people that are able to get decals on model kits without smushing them down with a Q-tip. I'm going to have to try that myself because I've never seen that done and it sounds like something I should at least try. One nice thing about the furball stencil set I got is that you receive a full set of stencils for a TPS scheme Tomcat and a full set of stencils for an earlier light gold gray over insignia white version Tomcat. You know, the really colorful ones. There's definitely quite a few stencils that need to go onto the Tomcat, so make sure you have a few nights set aside for this, because it's definitely something you're not going to bang out in one night. One part of this build that I knew I was going to have problems with was the canvas airbags that sit behind the swing wings. Now the problem here is I didn't want these to look like plastic, so I'd have to build them up to have a rubberish look to them. So that meant starting out with a dark gray, working up into lighter grays, and then eventually spraying some chipping fluid, and then chipping off a lighter paint, giving me some depth. But that was just the start, because later on in the build, I was going to come in with some oils and try to blend everything together. One thing that really helped out is not only did Scale Hanger 182 send me his spare decals for the AMK kit, he also posted up a video of his Tomcat and how he did the airbags, so I was able to reference that for the oil work. So make sure you go over to Scalehanger182 and check out his channel and tell him Robbie sent you. And again, a big thanks, bud. For chipping off the paint, I just use a dampened stiff brush and then later refine it with a toothpick. The trick is to just use some light pressure 
and let the tools do the work. If you try forcing them, you're gonna end up damaging the paint. With the painting on the airbags complete, it was now time to work on the engines. And normally this is an area where I cut corners because you can't really see in them when the model's done. But the F-14 has some pretty big blowers on it, so I figured it was worth the time and effort to make them pop. Edward has done a really good job capturing the detail in the burner cans, and even a simple wash would make these really pop. But like I said, I wanted to add some more detail, so that included some paint chipping and some different layers before getting into the oils. And the whole idea here is just to draw someone's eye in and build interest. The sponge chipping was done with a small piece of foam from the Edward kit, torn up a bit, and then dipped in paint. I then offloaded as much paint as possible into a paper towel before applying it to the inside of the burner cans. Once the chipping was done on the burner cans, I then used some highly diluted Tamiya rubber black and red brown to leave the stains. The trick here is to slowly build up the layers until you're happy with the staining. If it's not diluted enough, you're going to cover up all that work in two passes and have to start again. Moving even deeper into the engines, I decided just to keep things a little bit simpler and use some Mr. Metal Color paints. And the nice thing about the Mr. Metal Color paints is you're able to polish them after they've dried. This is all being done with a cotton bud and no pigments have been used at all. Once I was happy with the polishing, I then came in with a wash just to make those details pop. The idea behind a wash is to really push the contrast between parts and just to give your eye something more appealing to look at. With work on the engines done, it was time to move on to some other resin pieces. These ones being tires that I printed off from Ennie's website. The idea here is he gives you three different style tires, fully inflated, some with a little bit of a sag to them, and the ones I chose to use, which were actually quite flat, and I assumed that would be correct after looking at some photos, seeing what Tomcats looked like with a full loadout of bombs. So with just some regular primer, I was able to work these into the kit without any modifications at all. I'll definitely be buying some more of his stuff. I decided early on, before I even started building this Tomcat, that I really wanted it to have a lot of weathering going on with a lot of touch-ups, corrosion control, staining, all that good stuff. And the best way I find to replicate corrosion control is once all my decals are on and sealed under a flat clear, is to come in with my Procon Boy 270 airbrush. It's got a very small tip on it, 1.5 I believe, and it lets me really do some tight work. What happens on these aircraft is as they get corrosion building up on them, they come in, grind it down, make sure that it's still within a certain specification, and then paint on top of it. They're not permitted to paint the entire aircraft, they only paint the areas that they've repaired. So you'll often see naval aircraft look like patchwork. For the touch-ups, I used a mix of the paints I had already used on the model, and then I used some off grays like neutral gray, light gray, and other colors that would make sense being on a carrier. Often towards the end of the cruise, the crews will go down to get paint and they pretty much get what they can get. You might not have a big load of light ghost gray, so you might have to use the next best thing. There's been some photos out there of hornets with green and purple paint on them, so you're sure to have a lot of fun painting a naval aircraft. When it comes to removing the seam line on a canopy, the best advice I can give you is don't skip grits of sandpaper. If you start at 800, hit every grit on the way up. Hit 800, 1000, 1200, 2000. If you go right from 600 to 1200 or higher, you're gonna miss out some of those scratches. So you have to take your time and in the end, you'll have a really nice canopy. One difficult thing about painting exhaust nozzles on the Tomcat is that you have different tones in the steel depending on the reference photos you're using. I found the best way to keep the shine of the metal and to change the tones were to polish in some pigments. This was just one of those things that took a little bit of time, a soft hand, and some patience. And by slowly building up the effect, I was happy with the results. This was my first time using pigments to change the tone and colors of paints, and it served as a test bed because I have some other kits in the stash that are gonna need the same effect. It definitely doesn't hurt the more you try a new technique.
To take the weathering one step further, I found a lot of Tomcat reference photos that showed chipping down to the aluminum underneath. And in order to do that, I just used some more sponge chipping using Mr. Color Silver 8. The nice thing about that paint is it's very shiny, and even after adding some oils and washes on top, it'll still hold its sheen, making it pop from the flat paints around it. Now with all the painting done, it was time to move on to the washes. And the idea of the wash is to make the details pop. One thing I've noted though is that if I use a black wash, it immediately pushes things too far and makes the model look too toy-like. So I try to keep my washes very close to the colors around it. So for a naval aircraft, I'm using a dark blue pin wash, not black. The only time I'll use black is when I'm going into a higher use area, like inspection panels or hatches or in-flight refueling doors. Once that wash has had about 20 minutes to dry, I'll come in with some enamel thinner and gently wipe it away. Again, this is a process where you want to take your time because if you start trying to scrub that wash away, you're going to damage your paint and have more touch-ups to do. So take your time and use a very soft hand. Because there was so much gray going on with the Tomcat, which makes sense because it's a naval aircraft, I decided I needed to get a little bit of color in to make it more interesting. And to do that, I added some caps for the missiles and bombs. I simply made a cap in Fusion 360 and printed it off on my printer. I measured the kit parts as reference and the whole thing took about an hour and a half to design and then included a loophole in it so I could run some thread through. I then used Edwards Remove Before Flight Tags, ran it through the wire and then actually made it look like it was tied onto the missiles as they would be in real life. This is one of those things that it's definitely the cherry on top. To make the RBF tags look less 2D, I bent them up over my fingers a little bit to make them look like they were being rustled in the wind. Normally when an aircraft is armed up, it may not launch for a few hours, so it's, you don't want the sensors sitting out in the open on a missile that costs a few thousand dollars, especially if it could be easily damaged or expose someone to some nasty chemicals. OH and S and all that fun stuff. Now that the dark grayish blue pin wash has had time to dry, I then came in with a black pin wash on all the areas that would normally be moving on the aircraft or have a lot of high traffic slash access. Something that's really gonna capture dirt and grime. And this just goes on the same way as the other wash. The nice thing about using enamels or oils on top of a lacquer paint is you have a safety net if things don't go according to plan. If you're not happy with something, you can come back with some odorless thinner and wipe it all away to start again. Let's quickly talk about oil paint rendering. And the idea here is you're making very small localized filters to change the look of the paint underneath. Because I wanted my airbags on the wings to look more rubber-like and not just steel, I came in with the OPR and just slowly built up along the edges. And this is one of those things that will take some time. You'll add some oil, blend it in, dry it with the air dryer, and then repeat. Again, you wanna slowly take your time and build up those thin layers until you're happy with what you have. And by using different brushes like stippling or filberts, you can really change the effect the oil has. Here you can see me using the hair dryer, which is just like a save button, before moving into another layer. And as soon as you draw this with a hair dryer, you're pretty safe to work on top of it. After four layers of OPR, I was pretty happy with the effect. The one downfall of having gray on top of gray on top of other grays is just trying to keep it interesting. And oil paints allow you to do that. One cool thing about oil paints is by changing the amount of thinner in them, you can change the effect it has. Instead of having a wash, you can now do streaking. Instead of streaking, you can also do stains. The possibilities are pretty endless. Anywhere else that's gonna have hinges or a place for fluids to build up and store, that's somewhere you're really gonna to wanna to work at with the oils. And that just adds more character to your model. 
And that's going to bring this build pretty much to a close. As I show you a few other areas I work in here, I just want to say thanks everybody for being patient with this channel. It's been a busy spring and a busy summer as well, and I haven't had the time I expected. So what that's going to mean is you're going to see a slowdown in some videos coming out, but make sure you're following me on Instagram or Facebook because I do post photos quite frequently from the bench. Editing these videos takes a lot of time and dedication and requires me to find some quiet times during the week when the kids aren't around to be able to get at the computer. So if you see things slowing down on the channel, that is intended and I apologize, but at the same time it's summer and I wanna make sure I'm enjoying that time with my kids. I'm also shutting down the patron account because I feel like I'm not giving the patrons the benefits that they're expecting just with how busy things are in real life. So if you wanna see content, make sure you hit subscribe here, set the bell so you can see when new content comes out, and as always, make sure you leave your comments in the comment section. This video may be spicy, especially with it being the Tomcat, and I know there's a lot of big fans out there, so definitely leave your opinions below. In lighter news though, at the end of this summer, in September, I will be attending the Amps show in Calgary. So if you stop by, make sure you say hi, I should be there wandering around, because my favorite part of a model show isn't competing and isn't putting models in to win, but to meet the people that are there and talk with them and get inspired to do other projects. It's always nice being around like-minded people that have the same interest. So I will often find myself spending an entire afternoon just talking with people and not even really caring what's going on on the tables. And that's what the hobby should be, I believe. So at the end of the day, make sure you're having fun and enjoying it. This shouldn't feel like work and it shouldn't be causing you to burn out. That's going to be it for this video. I hope that the people who are asking on Instagram and Facebook for more information on how I did oils and the weathering techniques for this kit, I hope this helps you out because I made sure to take a little bit more time putting that into the video. That's going to be it for now. I am the Model Guy and I will see you next time. And always remember, if women don't find you handsome, they should at least find you handy. See you next time.